All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our Codex Speaker Series. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Marianne Williams to you. Uh, Professor Williams is uh, director of the Disruptive Innovation uh, of Disruptive Innovation at the University of Technology in Sydney. She's also affiliated faculty uh, with Codex. Um, she's been uh, listed as uh, RoboHub's uh, top 25 women in robotics. Uh, she's also a fellow with the Australian Academy of Techno uh, Technology, Technological Sciences and Engineering. And she's known as a leading authority in uh, knowledge uh, representation and uh, uh, reasoning with uh, a focus on AI, social robotics, machine learning, uh, robot ethics. Uh, and she's also uh, focusing a lot on IP and privacy law. Uh, her passion uh, in uh, innovation uh, for innovation science and technology uh, and uh, engineering uh, led her to establish uh, Australia's leading social robotics research group, which includes, among, among other uh, researchers, uh, Steve Wozniak. And uh, this group is uh, uh, focused on bringing science uh, fiction to reality through the design of intelligent autonomous systems uh, that can learn and adapt as they interact um, with uh, um, the world and with people. So uh, without further ado, so uh, Marianne's going to talk about social robots interacting and helping people. She will uh, tell us about their key capabilities and also discuss with us uh, legal and ethical challenges in this context. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Marianne. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan. Um, Roland. Thank you very much, Roland. Uh, I was thinking of Ryan Kahlo at that moment, so, uh, because he's, he's done some uh, very interesting writings uh, about AI, and very, very early as well. And I think that the last time I was in this room, speaking to an audience, we had a wonderful uh, panel talking about AI and the law. And that was you know five, six years ago, well before you know this tidal wave that uh, he just had arrived. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the capabilities of robots, in particular social robots, uh, the kind of business opportunities out there, and uh, then we'll end with some discussion of uh, legal and ethical challenges. And I'm, I'm hoping that you're going to have uh, a lot of good uh, questions and, and comments at the end. So uh, I have an amazing group. It does include Steve Wozniak. Uh, a couple of years ago was said, you know, I think in the future, humans will just be robots' pets. And um, I think that's uh, a very good sort of uh, summation. And I think today, they're very much, like, you know, robots today are a lot like various kinds of animals. Uh, and in fact, their intelligence level is probably no better than uh, an insect today, right? But just as we've seen evolution, create uh, more and more sophisticated kinds of intelligence. You know, people, humans are proof of concept. There should, there's no reason why we can't build human level AI or superhuman level AI. So a lot of what I'm talking about today uh, is work that has been generated from uh, my group. I have about 12 PhDs and um, over the last couple of years, half a dozen uh, postdocs. But, you know, uh, we do try to bring science fiction and fiction, or sorry, science fiction and fact together, but basically we have fun. Uh, and if it's not fun, we don't do it. Uh, so let's look at the kind of business opportunities. There, there was a watershed moment in 2013 in robotics. McKinsey released a report that uh, predicted that robotics uh, was a disruptive technology that's going to change everything. And that was sort of the beginnings of robotics getting into business schools, getting into the Harvard Business Review. And not a, a week goes by where there isn't a new article in you know, one of the top um, business schools uh, that refers to robots uh, taking jobs, creating jobs, you name it. All right. So the real turning point was that McKinsey report. Uh, we'll you know, we need to have a little discussion on what is a robot anyway, 
and in particular, what is a social robot? And uh, my group, we do a lot of experimentation, and I think this is where all the action really is. There's only so much you can do in a lab, right? Uh, there are so many truths you can discover in a research lab. Um, today, the game is out in the real world, uh, and some people call this you know, putting robots out in the wild and observing and seeing how people interact with them. And uh, there have been quite a few surprises. Then we'll get to the legal and ethical challenges. And then, you know, my, I guess my main point for today, uh, in case you fall asleep, I'll tell you now, that is, you know, we're sort of coming to the end of the AI era and there's a whole new frontier beginning and it's explainable AI. So, you know, black box AI, AI that can't explain its perceptions, decisions, and actions is useful. It can find, uh, you know, cancerous cells in uh, sort of, um, and, you know, cats in videos and things like that, right? Uh, supremely well. But there's a whole bunch of other super important applications in society that require explanation. But explanation isn't free. There's a computational cost and there's a time cost. So we don't want explanations for everything, and we don't really need explanations for everything. But some things, uh, explanations are critical. And uh, so that's sort of the, where we'll end. Okay, so I talked about this McKinsey report. Uh, they define disruptive technologies as advances that transform life, business, and the global economy. It's a pretty good definition. Um, and in this report, you know, robots are expected to impact more than nine trillion in value pools, right? They're a disruptive technology, so they are going to disrupt existing pools, market, and, and sort of network pools of value. And, but there's kind of a problem, and there was a problem, the problem was even worse back in, in, in 2019, and that is that robots are actually pretty dangerous. They're pretty stupid, all right? I mean, they satisfy the definition of insanity, you know, they keep doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. They're certainly psychopathic. They, they don't care about anything. So, you know, we've got a long way to go before we can really have robots living amongst us, working amongst us, and helping us doing even the sort of uh, dangerous and dirty work. Uh, but that's just opportunity, right? Uh, and the, the sort of vision is that, you know, we'll have robots um, transforming uh, manufacturing, uh, offering services, physical and digital, doing surgery. Uh, I mean, surgery is a, a good example because today, you know, a, a, a robotic surgeon is really just a tool that extends the expertise of, of the doctor. It's all very remote controlled, and the robot's not autonomous, it's not really making any decisions, it's responding to the motions of the doctor's body and, and maybe some other equipment. So um, I guess what I'm really saying here is that there's a lot of hype around uh, robotics, where we're at, and what we can do. But this is good, particularly for, I mean, this is very good, because while we're not there yet, it is clear we will get there. But uh, you know, the law, society, has got a lot of work to do to help us get there, particularly in the right way. I mean, it's clear that a lot of things could go very wrong. Uh, just consider the problems that, you might, uh, that we are already having in cybercrime and the Internet of Things. So let's get started and sort of think about, well, what are the kind of market business opportunities out there? And they tend to be kind of in three main groups. Uh, having robots out in the natural world, uh, in mines, in, on farms, okay? And that, that brings us a, a particular kind of problem, right? Uh, where, you know, I mean, it's very easy for us to go and pick an orange from a tree but to build a robot that can do that uh, safely and uh, reliably, you know, even when the sun's shining, okay, is quite challenging. Oops. Um, I have a little video here. So um, one of the robotics groups that, whoops, I think I've got to keep that there. 
at um, the, the University of Technology in Sydney, uh, created a company that um, builds robots uh, that can sand paint. And we have two up on the Sydney Harbour Bridge right now. And they are sanding all the old paint off. Now that's a horrendous job, okay? Uh, if humans do it, they can only sand for a very short time. All the dust has got to settle. It's in a confined space, so all of that uh, lead paint doesn't fall into the harbor or onto American tourists. And uh, so, you know, it's it's a horrible, horrible job. And these robots do an, ama an amazing uh, job. And uh, But you can see that, oh, well, um, people used to do this, and now the people who uh, did this job are in air-conditioned cabins supervising the robots. And when the robots miss something, they sort of tap them on the shoulder and tell them to go back and redo an area. And to get these robots on the Sydney Harbour Bridge, you know, it was uh, a massive effort, you know, getting the unions on board, uh, developing the technology that was actually safe. Uh, and so, you know, deploying these systems have a lot of challenges. Uh, and these robots are super dangerous. I mean, no people can be around these robots. They have no awareness of people, and they're sort of big and powerful. All right, what do we got here? What's only um, I don't know if you've heard of uh, Pepper, uh, but it's one of the the latest uh, social robotics. Uh, ro uh, yeah, social robots around. Uh, it's very simple. It uh, mainly has hands that can point and, and gesture. Uh, it couldn't possibly open a lid or anything like that. Uh, it has a face. Uh, it can change the color of its eyes with LEDs. So you know, if, it, if you make the eyes red, then perhaps people will think that it's angry or sad or needs something. If they're green, then maybe it's communicating everything is okay. But um, it's unclear how people would really interpret those colored lights in, in different circumstances. So uh, a couple of months ago, we just organized an experiment. We put the robot out there and uh, just uh, clocked you know, how people uh, interpreted the different colors of the lights. And uh, we got a lot of inconsistent data. Basically, there was no real pattern. Some people saw red as uh, the robot was angry, Others saw it that it was it was happy. Uh, so, you know, a lot of what you know you might think is obvious isn't actually obvious at all. Um, okay, let, let's go on to the the business opportunity. So this uh, this graph over here is a very very common one. Uh, it was developed in 2015, which is just before this inflection. And I've noticed over the years, you know, the inflection is always a year or a year and a half out. We, we never quite get there. Uh, and this is perhaps a more realistic uh, one. And in order to get this graph uh, and, and the report behind it, uh, you have to pay about $5,000. So it's a very, very serious uh, report. It's not just a bunch of people who have uh, talked to a few uh, robot manufacturers, which I think uh, many of the kind of uh, projections tend to be. You know, they're, they're very hopeful projections. So. The reality is going to be somewhere uh, in between. But what is true, OK, is that uh, even the people who are over-optimistic over and those who are sort of more pessimistic, they've still mis-underestimated mis growth. Yeah. Uh, and in particular, the consumer space. So the Pepper robot that you, you saw uh, earlier is an example of a, a consumer type robot. And it is clearly very different to the, the robots that are cleaning the Sydney Harbour Bridge because it is relatively safe to be near. But on the other hand, uh, if that robot fell downstairs on top of you or a small child, you know, that is obviously going to cause damage. And so, um, you know, even for robots that are developed uh, to you know, uh, interpret human emotion and to interact with people, are and still can be quite dangerous. Okay, so you know this is kind of where we're at um, with respect to McKinsey's prediction of you know robots, you know just changing the game entirely. Um, and there's been quite a lot of action. So new roles popped up in organisations. The chief robotics officer, 
there are several of those these days. SoftBank, that's owned by Japan's richest man, and he is leading uh, big investments and in startups and in his own company in uh, robotics. So there's a lot of um, investment in social robots today. And for that reason, I think people expect uh, that we will be seeing increasing numbers of robots okay, available. Right now, there's maybe 20 different robots that you could buy and have in your home. And that's not counting vacuum cleaners, right? Um, Sony was one of the leaders in the early 2000s in these kinds of robots. And uh, they shut down their robotics group in about 2005. And uh, when it shut down, no one thought it would ever come back to life. You know, usually when these things are shut down, they're, they're kind of destroyed. Uh, but a few weeks ago, uh, Sony has uh, brought its robotics team back together. Uh, a lot of the people were still there, and certainly the leaders were still there. And uh, they released a, a new robot. So th there's, there's a lot of interest. There's a lot of action. And so maybe some of those earlier efforts were just too early. And maybe uh, now is the time. Um, there are a whole bunch of you know, robots that uh, you could buy for Christmas. I think that's the these robots are trying to get uh, onto Amazon um, for for Christmas. And uh, you know, in terms of uh, watershed moments, what you're seeing here is a whole bunch of robots that are less than one thousand dollars. Somehow, the thousand dollars is the magic number in, in consumer ele uh, electronics. And um, so that, that's another kind of uh, big shift. All right, so what is, what is a robot? We still haven't got there yet. Uh, well, uh, some people like to define a robot as a computer that can sense. Uh, it can process the data that it collects through its senses, and then it can act. So uh, you, know, you could argue that uh, a, an ordinary computer does that. So uh, it's very hard to actually define a robot. In fact, it's hard to define anything. I mean, try, try and define a chair. Uh, you know, a log could be a chair. You know, if you're sitting on the table, then you know, that could be a chair. So it, it's, it's not that easy to define anything. So you know, we, we never get too hung on, up on it, right? And uh, you know, it's not quite as bad as pornography in terms of definition because uh, we can probably write down some kind of properties uh, of robots that kind of uh, can circumscribe a class of you know, machines reasonably well. Um, so the EU recently uh, tried to do this in a very formal way. They identified uh, five or four different um, areas of application that they want to consider. Uh, they identified five different kinds of um, features, autonomy, human-robot interaction, uh, nature, the environment, and the task. Right? And then they, using these things, they, they tried to define uh, what is a smart robot. And I think they have how many? five kinds of properties. So. Uh, that they're autonomous, right? So by taking data from their senses or exchanging data, because robots are going to be, and, and are today, connected to the internet, right? And the internet of things. In fact, um, I think robots of the future are going to be much more like the Jedi Knights than C-3PO um, or R2-D2, because they will have the force and, you know, we will need you know, some device to access our lights and you know, our cars and things like that. They can just do it seamlessly, directly, without you even knowing. OK, um, okay. they can learn from experience. Optional, I like that. Uh, and that they, they have some kind of physical embodiment of some kind. Um, so it's not you know, something in the cloud. Um, and they can adapt and change um, as they sort of operate in their environments. And you know, 
they, they're not actually alive in the biological sense. But, I mean, I, I think it's very difficult to uh, use these rules or these properties uh, because I think biological life is really being challenged. And even, I mean, it's always been challenged. You know, is a virus life or not? I mean, it's very, these five properties don't necessarily help at all. Okay, I mean, it's good to you know start the conversation and have something in mind, but I think you know we in this room could probably come up with another set of five which are just as good um, and possibly better. All right, but this is sort of an attempt. Okay, and the reason that you need these definitions obviously is so that you can begin to build policies and law that build on them and introduce you know restrictions and. Uh, other kinds of <coughs> policies that you would need. Why is this working? Oh. OK. So a social robot is a smart robot, but it's so much more than that, OK? So the robots on the Sydney Harbour Bridge, well, I guess we're all going to agree they're smart. I mean, they can find where the, the paint is still hanging uh, or still on the bridge and needs to be sanded off. So being smart just means you can solve problems. So we've got uh, robots that can play chess. We've got AI systems that can beat people at playing Go, which is a very um, stunning achievement, right? But intelligence is so much more, OK? Uh, what about uh, emotional <coughs> intelligence? Just being aware of yourself and entities around you, agents, other robots, um, other devices, uh, people. And then the social intelligence, being sociable. And that uh, usually means that, you know, you can get other agents, people, other robots to do things you want them to do so that you can influence them, all right? And so it's, a, it's very different to usual kind of uh, problem solving. It's, it, it's far more complex. Okay. So that's what we mean by a social robot. The social robot's kind of at the at the sort of the highest level of the robot tree. Okay, you've got all the robots uh, who can solve problems down here. You have robots who have some uh, awareness of themselves and other entities around them. So consider a, and then on top of that, you have the robots that have social um, abilities, all right, that can communicate to other agents and get them to do things. So a, a, a typical vacuum cleaner is going to be at the bottom level. All right, it's, it, it does a job, it can avoid obstacles, and it can systematically you know, clean the floor. But in terms of sociability, it just ignores people. It treats people like an object uh, to be avoided, and it doesn't have any social skills. All right, uh, and so when you design um, a social robot, then you know, you're, you're operating in a sort of human-centered uh, design paradigm, okay? And the main things you have to design and build are, are the actual physical nature of the robot. Its shape, its appearance. Uh, is it going to look like Pepper? Is it going to look like a PR2? Is it going to look like this very creepy child? Um, and I'm sure you've all heard of the Uncanny Valley. I put it there because um, there's always someone in the audience who hasn't quite heard of it. But essentially, what people have noticed is that as you build robots that are closer and closer to the human form, the, the creepier they get. Like, this is kind of creepy. Um, and uh, so how a robot looks affects you very much, right? If you think a robot's creepy, you're probably unlikely to trust it. You probably don't want this robot looking after your children or um, ensuring that your grandmother is okay. Uh, so how the robot looks has a big influence on how people experience the robot, all right? And then, you know, it's uh, what's on board. What, you know, what can the robot actually do in terms of those three levels of intelligence? And the big area of interest these days is human-robot interaction, um, engagement. So how can the robot get your attention and keep you engaged? And then what's your experience? Um, was it enjoyable? Do you, do you want more of that? Um, and so but they're the sort of themes that we'll look at now. 
So uh, maybe a year and a half ago, uh, Georgia Tech did some really interesting work on robot trustworthiness. And they came up with a very surprising result. Uh, and essentially what they did is they uh, got 42, I've got the details here, 40, they got 42 volunteers, they uh, talked to them one by one and they said, okay, we want you to follow this robot to a particular room. Um, I think it was for a job interview, but um, you can read the paper and check on that. So, you know, one by one they, they followed the robot to this room, but the robot deliberately made a mistake and took them to the wrong, wrong place. Um, and to sort of establish that it wasn't that reliable, okay? And ev eventually they got to the right room. And then the researchers simulated a fire, like literally smoke was coming in the room. And some, some people like waited quite a long time before they did anything. But eventually they all, every single one of them, went out the door and followed the robot's instructions on how to exit, even though it was the opposite to uh, the exit signs. So that, that is sort of shocking that people uh, trusted the robot even though it you know, was unreliable and, uh, and it was offering directions which were sort of inconsistent with what you might expect. So um, one of the reasons this was a great experiment is that it showed yet again that a lot of the things that we take for granted are possibly not true and we really need to go check on just about all of them. But the other thing it also highlights is just how difficult it is to run these experiments because, you know, in terms of explaining uh, that behavior, there is just so many variables uh, in this particular experiment. So, you know, what if we change the robot a little bit? What if, uh, you know, it was the creepy robot? What if, you know, there are just so many what ifs. But that tells us exactly where this field is. All right, we are very much in the early, early stages of just getting robots out of the lab uh, into the real world. And that is also fraught with a lot of difficulty in running these experiments because when you sort of recruit uh, volunteers to uh, be subjects in them, you, you kind of don't, you, you can't give the game away, right? And so you have to sometimes not be truthful or withhold information and it's, it's really fraught, and I think that most roboticists are, are not prepared uh, for those kinds of experiments which the field really needs. Okay, that's uh, what it looks like. All right, so we've been doing some uh, experiments ourselves, and this is another, uh, well, this is an application uh, by a real company that also got people's attention. So this is a robotics uh, company here in the valley called Savvy Oak, and they have a partnership with um, Crown Hotels. Um, and they deployed lots of these robots in the hotels, and, and they had a really interesting finding uh, that they also apparently didn't expect. And that is people made more calls to this robot than to the human concierge. And it turns out that the reason for this is that robots don't make judgments. So people actually like working with robots. You know, they're not going to say, oh, Hello, you know, your so delivery has I brought you the toothpaste already and now you've realized that you need the toothbrush. You know, like, why didn't you realize you needed both at the same time? Uh, and even if you kind of... Um, <coughs> mitigate for things like, well, having this robot deliver something is obviously fun, so uh, that's going to skew the numbers. But just this thing around robots not making judgments is, is, is extremely powerful and uh, it's kind of lurking everywhere in all of these kinds of uh, interactions. So uh, we've done some experiments uh, in shopping centres. We had this robot offering samples, chocolate, and uh, we kind of measured its performance uh, next to a human offering the same kind of chocolates in the same kind of scenario. And the behavior that we observed was that people approached the, the, the robot in, in groups. It was like safety in numbers. And, uh, you know, that, that, so that was uh, something we, we didn't expect. We actually expected 
more people would approach the robot just for the novelty value, right? Uh, but this is kind of, uh, well, in, in my lab, like we've had robots for a very long time. There's robots going, you know, moving around the lab, doing stuff. We're all used to robots, but probably most people in the shopping center had never seen a real robot in real life. And they were quite wary of it. And uh, so we also, more recently, um, went to a lot of uh, trouble getting uh, this robot, which, by the way, belongs to the Commonwealth Bank. They're one of our partners. Uh, at the airport involved uh, talking to the New South Wales police and you know we had to get this robot on the air side and uh, the robot was helping at check-in and also at the gate and uh, we sort of um, developed a whole methodology of how a whole new methodology I mean it, there was really nothing there before about how you deploy a, a social robot uh, then in, in the workplace, so we set up this experiment. So uh, here's the robot, and here's a, just a camera and a, a laptop, okay? And what we were trying to see is, or, or, or to find out from people, is, is whether, how much information they would disclose. And did it matter if uh, they gave the information to a robot as opposed to a computer with a camera? And it turns out that uh, people did disclose more, and they were also more prepared to share information on Facebook uh, with the robot as opposed to um, just the, the computer. And we had several hundred um, subjects in this experiment. So, you know, this, this pattern is, is, you know, pretty strong. Um, and. The motivation for this experiment was, you know, to try and uncover and find insights around, you know, what people are willing to, to share with a robot. And for example, if this robot was in your workplace, do you want it to treat you every day like it's met you for the first time? Or do you want it to actually keep information about you every day so that it can tell you a joke that you might appreciate or remind you of something uh, that you needed a reminder for. Uh, because, you know, it's not going to be too long where we will have such robots wandering around, and different people have different preferences, okay? And it seemed like, uh, and there was a post um, kind of experiment interview, and it seems like uh, people are a lot more comfortable with, with the robot knowing things. But uh, they also are unsure what the robot does know. So uh, is the robot remembering their photo or other information about them? So you know, every experiment opens the doors for new experiments. Uh, one of the theories for the Georgia Tech robot uh, experiment where the people just followed the robot was authority. That the, the main explanation the researchers gave for that behavior was that uh, people saw the robot the emergency guide uh, as an authority figure. So if it said go that way, they went that way. So we set up uh, an experiment. Uh, this is a PR2 robot. Again, this is, uh, was developed here in Silicon Valley. And it, it sort of blocked off a door and told people who approached it that uh, they had to use the other door, which wasn't very far away. And, um, and the robots could actually get bigger. And it's quite an intimidating thing. Uh, so it, uh, most people did actually follow its instructions. But you know, we got some counterintuitive results. So in terms of the degree of uh, aggression, people who followed it thought that it was less aggressive than the people who didn't follow it. So that's kind of strange. Um, and, uh, but yeah, most people actually followed the robot or, or did do what it asked it to do. Uh, so one way to advance the field, okay, is through international competitions. And I don't know if you've heard of RoboCup. Uh, it was started literally 20 years ago, 1997. And it started with uh, soccer, soccer players. and. The reason it started is because back in the 1990s, researchers were working on 
parts of robots. So if people interested in vision mainly worked with cameras, people working on locomotion worked on legs and wheels and things like that. So there wasn't really any integrated robots happening. And uh, the Japanese in particular were very concerned because they have an aging population and they saw robots as the kind of solution, and they still do. So they said, well, how can we get people to integrate all these technologies and have a real working robot? So there was actually several years of debate among scientists. You know, is this good for science, bad for science? You know, what, what will people do? Oh, they'll just, you know, exploit the rules and cheat like fury and try and win. Uh, others argued, no, this will actually get people working together, have benchmark problems and things like that. And, you know, at the end of the day, both behaviors were uh, rampant. Uh, but, you know, it's been going for 20 years, and one of the reasons you see robots these days is because of RoboCup, right? If, if RoboCup hadn't happened and there was uh, no incentive really to bring all of these technologies together, then, you know, we probably wouldn't have the kinds of robots that we have uh, even in, in labs. Uh, so it's been pretty useful. And this year they introduced a whole new league in social robotics, and uh, they use a number of robots, and, and this is one in particular. Oops. Um, so the way it works is that you go to a competition, and they set up a, a home. This is like the kitchen, the dining room. This is the bedroom. This is the uh, balcony. And then this is sort of uh, the living room. And they, they set up missions. So the robot, uh, one of the missions was uh, a cocktail party. So this area was full of people. Uh, the robot had to go and take orders. And uh, so, you know, someone would wave and it would approach them and get their order. And it had to memorize not just their, the image of their face and, and maybe what clothing they were. It had to derive a description that it could pass on to a human. So the barman, for example. So the robot could say, the tall guy in the red shirt wants a margarita. And then the barman would deliver it. So that, that's an example of one of these. And uh, I mean, that's fairly social, but I think uh, some of these missions could be uh, even more social. Uh, and at this competition this year, my, my team, as you can see them here, uh, won the Human Robot Interaction uh, Award, which was really fantastic. Um, OK. So now to the legal challenges. So I, I think that the discussion around legal and ethical issues is enabled and a lot more interesting if it is connected to today's technology and what are the actual capabilities um, of these machines. So here's a kind of a, a list of the sorts of um, issues that social robots raise. So these are robots living close to people. And that includes you know, exoskeletons, for example. Um, and we'll, we don't have time to look at all of them, but we do have time uh, to look at some of them. So you know, there's been a lot in the press recently around bias, uh, where you know, AI systems are uh, computing the sentence for people who have been found guilty. And they've discovered that um, it's, it's actually uh, discriminating against uh, people of color. And not surprisingly, because it's being trained with historical data. And so uh, in a way, having AI do this and everybody saying, oh my god, look what it's doing, is helpful really, isn't it? Because it's, it's actually exposing a, a problem that uh, was too easy for too long uh, kept underground. So even when AI fails, it does good work. Um, and, and fairness, I mean, consider a, a robot um, in an elder care facility, right? So this robot will be shared. It's like the robot in the shopping center. Uh, it'll be bringing things, fetching and carrying, also entertaining different people. But what if it spends more time with one person than another or is perceived to do that? How can we ensure that you know, even the robot's time is shared around fairly? Or the resources that the robot is distributing um, is also fairly distributed? I mean, I think th this is a really big problem kind of uh, lurking in terms of the uh, robot's 
uh, decisions. Okay, whoops. And then there's um, whoops. nudging. You know, there's a fine line between nudging and bullying, right? If I'm trying to get you to change your behavior for your own benefit, right? But who's deciding if it's for your own benefit? Uh, so, you know, we're all guilty of this, um, especially parents, right? We try so many different ways to get our kid to learn the trumpet or do piano or, uh, I don't know, exercise, play soccer, you name it, right? Um, but where's the line here? And uh, what about, uh, you know, when you're out shopping? Uh, if the shop is placing things, various items in, you know, to get your attention or to help you make certain decisions. And, and we know that's happening. Uh, that's certainly happening online, in games, in any kind of selling online. And, you know, even Google was found to be uh, nudging people in, uh, you know, the direction of its own products over others and, and was found, uh, was uh, fined uh, significantly just a few months ago. So, again, that's, that's pretty rampant. And then trans, uh, transparency and accountability. So, if robots and other AI systems are making decisions that affect people, then, you know, how transparent do they need to be? And, you know, what kinds of decisions um, should be more transparent? I mean, there, is, there's, there's going, there are limits, all right? to the kinds of accountability and transparency that, that people can offer, all right? So um, I was chatting with Mark earlier, you know, none of us can really explain why we see a particular color, all right? We, we just see it and we know, like it's, it's, it's brown, it's really brown, you know, I can tell you a million times it's brown but I can't really, you know, tell you why uh, or give you any extra information. Um, you know, we could go into a scientific discussion about, you know, frequency of um, the visible spectrum, but that's not helpful either, okay? Uh, but there's a whole lot of other kinds of decisions where you do need more accountability or at least explainability of these decisions. And more on that a bit later. Obviously, privacy and security are, are huge and, um, but what we've, I think we've learned uh, in other, with other systems is, you know, privacy is um, very helpful. You know, try turning off cookies on your browser and pretty, you know, you, you'll last five minutes because you, you'll just get tired of typing everything in all the time. It is very convenient for your browser to have your browsing history. It's just helpful to you. It's a kind of, and, if you decide you don't want that, well, there's a huge cost to you. And uh, systems aren't really making that kind of easy or, or making that um, attractive in any way. Uh, okay, and just a few weeks ago, uh, a robot was given citizenship in Saudi Arabia. Um, there have been numerous uh, papers written on robot rights. So, uh, you know, the, these things are kind of o over the horizon maybe, but definitely going to arrive at some stage. So let's just pick up on bias and, and discrimination. So, you know, here in the United States, you know, you, you can't discriminate on the base of, of race, color, religion, a whole bunch. Uh, in, in Australia, you know, the list is also very, very long. And uh, if, if AI and robots are making decisions that affect each one of us, and, and, and they do, billions of people, uh, and even if the robot is just the gateway to the Internet of Things or to you know, other AI systems, because of the nature of that gateway and the fact that they are going to have a face and you will trust them, uh, kind of exacerbate the underlying problem quite dramatically. So, you know, what, what if a robot refused service? What if you went to, uh, you know, a bank and it just, you know, you couldn't engage the robot. It, it wouldn't even, you know, it was just ignoring you or avoiding you, okay? So, well, so long as the, is the robot is consistently doing that to, um, you know, maybe you're not wearing a shirt, maybe you're not wearing footwear, whatever. Uh, so long as it's doing that consistently and universally, uh, you know, then maybe it's okay. But 
you know, that's not, easy, not going to be easy for uh, a robot at all, okay? And we're very far from being able to build systems that could, um, you know, provably do this. Uh, okay, so if you've seen uh, The Robot and Frank, um, sorry, if you haven't seen it, I recommend it. This is a, a small clip from it. It's, um, oh, no, there's one before it. This is, this is, this is better. So we'll start with this, okay? So the question is, you know, when is nudging uh, bullying? Wake up, Frank. <laughs> sorry. It's seven, Frank. Wake up. Wake up, Frank. It's seven, Frank. Wake up. Frank, it's crucial that we establish a set schedule for your day to help keep you oriented. Frank. I've reviewed your medical records. Are you finding your episodes of disorientation increasing in frequency? What the hell are you? I'm a robot, Frank. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How you doing? I'm fine, Frank. <coughs> Wake up. Okay, well that was pretty tame. Next one's a bit more interesting, because the robot has actually done something. It's taken an action. This thing is sick. That cereal is full of unhealthy ingredients. I threw it away. Don't throw away my stuff. Frank, that cereal is for children. Enjoy this grapefruit. You're for children. Today we're going to start a garden. <laughs> Frank, you need a project. Mental stimulation plus a regimented schedule will vastly improve your cognitive functioning. Besides, it's good exercise. Frank, we're going to have to work together. You are a robot butler. I'm not a butler, Frank. I'm a healthcare aide, programmed to monitor and improve your physical and mental health. Yeah, get out of my house. <laughs> if you're not going to cooperate with me, I might as well not be here. Fine with me. If that's the way you feel, I'll contact Hunter. Good. Hunter's his son. What are we doing? You got a phone up there in that brain? You calling him? Look, you heard what he said. He was trying to put me into a nut house. <laughs> I don't recall Hunter saying that. There's nothing wrong with my memory. I'm fine, I'm telling you. I'm fine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. My memory is fine. What am I doing? I'm talking to an appliance. I suggest you work with me. I'm not gardening. <laughs> okay, I'll do that. So um, that, that's a really good movie if you haven't seen it. Uh, they, uh, those two scenes are actually the best scenes, uh, but it's worth watching, worth watching uh, the movie. Um, I don't want to give the, the game away. Uh, but the reason I like it is it because it... it, it it feels like that could happen, right? It feels, you know, uh, very uh, close. Like, we could probably program a, a Pepper robot today to, to do something close to that, you know. And it's not on a spaceship or on another planet somewhere, so it's uh, not happening in a different universe. And it, it highlights in a very simple way these, the, the, the sort of the ebbing of the flowing of power and uh, I don't know, control uh, between the human and, and the robot. So um, I think it's helpful to kind of uh, focus on um, the kinds of issues that people uh, are going to face very, very soon. And I think in the elder care uh, area, that's sort of uh, low-hanging fruit as far as people uh, are concerned because, uh, you know, the... We have an aging population, we're going to need more people, there aren't enough uh, people to do a lot of that work. And also a robot in that situation can add a lot of value, right? Uh, they don't care if they hear the same story over and over again. And 
uh, there, there's sort of some useful kind of um, relationship stuff that they could be fulfilling. It can also be a gateway to Skype, and they can be sort of a more intelligent uh, kind of iPad. So, you know, Granny doesn't have to find the, the iPad. The iPad comes to her. And um, anyway, so I thought the next thing we might look at, because we're just about finished, is this, this is from last week. So I talked about uh, social robots being the Jedi Knights of the future, right? Because they'll be connected to the Internet of Things. But other technologies are also taking great sort of leaps and bounds. And one of them uh, that is going to also be integrated into kind of the social robot ecosystem is um, human brain interface, all right? So. So I, in a way, I think it's it's too late. Um, it's already. Um, I don't think we can we can stop it from happening because it's already happening. But I think this is this kind of stuff is the source of Elon Musk's sort of uh, prediction that you know AI is going to take over and kill us all. Um, and but it, you can see that it is very very powerful. Actually, next to my lab is another lab that does um, uh, thought control. And they've been working on that problem for maybe 10 years. They've developed a, a um, wheelchair for the severely disabled, people who can't even use the little straw or blow to go left or right, right? And they just sort of uh, put on a little hat and they can, get, they can move that uh, wheelchair around. So they're just giving sort of macro commands, you know, forward, reverse, left, right, stop. Uh, the robot's doing, you know, all these sort of autonomous. So if, if we tell the robot to go forward, you know, it's not going to go in here. It'll navigate around, avoid obstacles and stuff like that. So it's, it's a semi-autonomous thing. But, um, you know, that, that's just uh, extraordinary. And it, it's also very real and already here today. So, you know, it, there is urgency um, to kind of think about these things and to ensure that... Uh, you know, we kind of shape things uh, for the future in a way that is going to be helpful to humanity and, um, and not just some of humanity. So my solution is um, making more AI explainable. So there's a huge movement over the last couple of years that has recognized that, you know, one of the big problems with AI Okay, is that it's not transparent, it's not accountable, it does, can't explain its decisions. So there are some things we can't explain, but there are a lot of things that we can explain. You know, any sort of uh, deliberative effort, we, can, we tend to be able to explain. Uh, any kind of reactive, if somebody clapped over here, I would turn, well, I, I couldn't really explain that, okay? It was just a reaction. Uh, so it's not that we want to be able to explain everything, but we want to be able to explain things that need to be explained. And we need to identify what that, what that is. I mean, I don't think we could even say today the kinds of decisions that require explanation. Now, we wouldn't want to say everything needs to be explained. And the reason is that explanation has a cost. There's a computational cost. There's a cost in time. There's a cost in lots of other things. And, and some people have even argued, well, if you insist on that kind of level of explanation, then, you know, IP is at risk, uh, all kinds of things, you know, trade secrets, stuff like that. So where, where is the line? What does need to be explained? And um, even in hum human society, there's different kinds of expectations uh, and lots of sort of professions 
have this kind of built in. So, you know, someone lower down on the kind of hierarchy may need to explain more uh, than somebody who is sort of uh, the guru, right? You don't question gurus, you just do what they say, right? So, uh, you know, understanding how explanations are required by these AI systems and certainly robots. Like, when should the robot explain what it's doing? And when doesn't it need to? Um, so anyway, this is the new frontier in AI, and it's called XAI. And there's um, quite a bit available. There's a new DARPA program called uh, Explainable AI. And uh, that's where this picture comes from. And you know, the, the idea is to say, well, you know, a deep learning network can say, oh, well, there's a, there's a cat in this picture. Whereas uh, a system that can explain will say, because it has fur, whiskers, and claws. Okay? Uh, so, you know, that, that's sort of uh, useful. But being able to say these things, like fur, whiskers, um, doesn't really tell us an awful lot, all right? But it's better than nothing. Uh, and it's providing some level of transparency, right? Everybody wants transparency. But transparency is not an explanation, okay? Getting more information isn't always helpful, right? You need to know, you know, what's the justification or the reason for something or the cause. Or you may want to know what, why specific features are important, okay? So what if this cat was in an accident and only had one ear? You know, what would, you know, this system might be able to say, well, it didn't think it was a cat because it only, it didn't have two ears that looked like that. So, um, so these are the kinds of explanations people want. They want to know why. And they don't want to know why for everything, but if something is surprising, if something uh, is sort of uh, strange, then we want to, we want to know why. It's, it's, it's uh, kind of important to us. It's, and I think these systems, certainly today, have very little capability in explanations of any kind. And uh, this will probably have to change. And I think, you know, even from a business perspective, it's going to have to change because it means that if I can produce a social robot for under $1,000 before this Christmas that can offer some explanation to its behavior, then maybe uh, people will buy my product uh, in favor of somebody else's. So, um, I mean, I, I'm one of those very hopeful engineers who think that, you know, people buy better engineered products and better designed products. I think they do. Um, before I end, I just wanted to tell you about something we're creating here at uh, Codex, the AI Policy Hub. And uh, we're very keen to kind of work with people to um, explore safety and security issues around AI, ethics, uh, the impact on governments. I mean, boards these days need to understand uh, the AI systems uh, and need to appreciate uh, the need to be able to prove that their AI systems are not um, breaking the law, that they're, they're not discriminating uh, when they're making recommendation or offering services, et cetera. And the, these are very, very serious issues. So uh, this is a super exciting time, I think, to be interested in AI and robots and, and the law, uh, because we've got systems out there in the real world. We've got systems coming out of labs. and. Uh, Basically, a big experiment is, is going on. And if you understand the issues and uh, enjoy thinking about the implications of these sorts of technologies, then you know, uh, there's a lot of kinds of avenues where you can help to shape uh, the future. Um, so questions? Yeah, please use the mics. Hi, so um, very extremely interesting. Um, and so I, I say what I'm about to say not out of any kind of, you know, I'm not coming at you. I'm just very interested in the work you do. I think it's extremely interesting work. Um, but, you know, over the long term, this 
this, these sort of broader trends worry me very deeply, uh, and there are a few reasons for that. Oh, is it not on? Or, okay. Um, three reasons for that. One is massive social disruption. Um, uh, the other is um, cybersecurity issues. Um, and so I'm wondering uh, a, a few things. One, if, I mean, and I'll just explain the social disruption thing. I mean, you know, it's like a, a lot of the low-hanging fruit professions that you talked about and some that you didn't talk about, like long-haul truck driving. I mean, you know, millions and millions of people are employed in those jobs. Where are they going to go? You know, you could argue that a large reason for Trump's victory was, you know, manufacturing job losses caused by, by automation, et cetera. Um, so I'm wondering, first, if you disagree in general with that sort of broad concern I have about massive job loss, and also if the, the, the robotics community pays any mind to that in, a, in any form um, when they're going about their work. Uh, and then on the, on the cybersecurity question, just interested to know um, sort of how, how you guys grapple with that uh, in your work. Thank okay. you. So yes, I mean, I, I do acknowledge the, the, the job loss um, issue. But I think that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an optimist. I'm a extreme optimist, OK? And if you look at the sort of uh, waves of technology, they've always created more jobs. So because you, you, you increase the market by you know, lowering prices of things, you give more people access. I mean, the, just look at the growth of China. You know, this is, you're creating a, a massive middle class who want all of the things that we have. This is a driver. This you know, grows the pie. So I think that in the long run, uh, and even in the short run, because these technologies will not happen overnight. Okay? They're not going to suddenly wake up one day and you know, a robot can do your job. So I think that robots will augment, or uh, robots will be able to um, assist. They will help us scale. And they'll be able to help us scale things we humans don't actually want to do. So, uh, and I think that there is plenty of growth around those kinds of, of jobs. Um, I think you know the other concern is uh, how much uh, people are being paid because uh, seems like you know there is plenty of jobs um, in Australia. Unemployment is like five percent here. It's kind of roughly the same, right? So and and robots uh, have been kind of available for the last ten years. So that it, I mean, there's no real evidence that they're taking jobs, okay? Uh, but the real concern is the amount of income that we humans are being paid. It seems like there are new jobs, but they're not as well paid, or the conditions are less. And that, that I think, is a, a real concern, particularly here in, in the US, because it's sort of a drive to the bottom. Yeah. But I don't think technology is you know, solely responsible or even largely responsible for that. Yeah, it's just an ongoing trend of the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. And then, thank you. And then, uh, just on the cybersecurity issue. Yeah. So, cybersecurity is always, uh, you know, a big problem. So, um, I gather that when uh, people, you know, first created pacemakers and actually put them in people, there, there was no security on them whatsoever. And you know, you can connect to a pacemaker. You can make somebody's heart just explode by making it, you know, pump uh, 300 beats a minute. I mean, you just do that. You just type in 300, and away it goes. So. I think that engineers, uh, especially on the frontier, don't design you know, new technologies with security in mind. Um, so often those, uh, and, and, and consider technologies out of startups. You know, they don't necessarily have the expertise. They're cutting corners. Every, they're just kind of getting a proof of concept out there. So uh, yeah, I think that there's a certain risk but uh, you know there are laws in place that also, also you know if something does go wrong they're in trouble. But that doesn't really help the people who've uh, been injured or harmed. Um, but you know I think increasingly uh, people consider uh, security as a design feature. Similarly, privacy these days, right? There's a whole big movement around privacy by design and things like that. But you know, in my lab, we do have expertise in uh, security, but it's not something that we deploy in our experiments, even when we put the robot out in the real world, in the shopping center and uh, the airport. I mean, they were just proof of concept systems. And no, we didn't really have any security, except we do have a big button that we can press and kill whatever the robot's doing. But that may not even be desirable, right? Because Stopping it may not actually be the right thing if it's sort of falling over or what have you. Okay. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, thanks. 
again for being here. Um, so you mentioned when you were talking about uh, bias and discrimination in some of these algorithms, um, whether it's in sentencing or in mm. you know credit scores or hiring practices, whatever it is, um, you mentioned one of the solutions being explainability. It seems like there's still going to be, even once these things are more explainable, if you're a human being on the other end of a decision made by a robot or an autonomous system, you're still perhaps naturally going to have a different instinct or reaction to that. See it as you know less fair or less acceptable, even if even if you're given an explanation that meets the criteria you mentioned. When you look at human attitudes towards these things, what in addition to explanation and transparency, what other work do you think needs to be done so people get more comfortable with the fact that decisions impacting their real lives um, are going to be made by machines? Uh, well, I mean, the, I don't really have anything other than uh, to kind of emphasize that, you know, if you, if, if, if a AI system or a robot can tell you not just about why it saw the cat, but the process it undertook to see the cat, like it could tell you about uh, the actual model it used, whether it used regression or, you know, whatever, then that can help you diagnose the problem and help you maybe train it or the people who have deployed it to train it, right? Because you can draw attention to say, hey, you know, like something is obviously amiss. And the usual, or sorry, probably the usual way to fix it is going to be to present that system with different data. So certainly you could correct the, uh, the system that was making the sentencing, okay? Uh, by giving it different data. And you would have to kind of uh, source that data from somewhere, or increasingly these days, we create it. You have synthetic data sets, okay, that have particular patterns or are just noise, just noise that sort of disturb the, uh, these algorithms and uh, broaden their kind of um, outputs. But I don't really have anything else than that. Thanks. Hi. So thank you again for mm -hmm. your talk. And it seemed like a lot of the like kind of current technologies you were talking about are in terms of robotics are very specialized. So you talked about like kind of Watson or the one that can do one thing like play chess really well, but that's all it does. And I was wondering, is that kind of the trend in robotics or is the trend towards more generalized kind of jack of all trades? robotics that can handle multiple tasks and kind of analyze and diagnose tasks. And I was wondering if you could talk about like kind of the benefits and challenges around that. Yeah. Well, I, I think there are several threads. Uh, the kind of um, uh, neural net approach does tend to be fairly narrow. Uh, so it's a lot easier to build a system that is uh, highly specific and solving a sort of well-structured or well-understood problem. And usually those problems are in narrow domains, right? But the ultimate goal of AI is to build, you know, the sort of generalist, uh, common sense reasoning capability um, of a human. And that was the original actual uh, goal of AI. And that's really hard. And that's why you, you don't kind of see a lot of progress there, because uh, researchers need to invest maybe decades into that, and you know all of the other pressures and uh, incentives uh, in in research and even you know in companies don't speak to that at all, right? So you you know there's a lot more investment in addressing you know specific tasks like the vacuum cleaner, right? Um, but there are some interesting efforts in the sort of more general AI. And uh, DARPA, for example, in the last DARPA challenge, you had to build a, a humanoid-like robot that could actually drive a car. So rather than build a car that can drive itself, build a robot that can jump in and drive a car like you do. And uh, yeah, a lot of progress was made toward that. I think the prize was a million dollars. So you know that was enough incentive for uh, labs to go after. But yeah, the main reason is it's a very hard problem. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I want to ask about uh, explainable AI and maybe in the sort of opposite direction from the last question about it. Um, 
I, I, I totally understand why uh, we want things to be explained. I want things to be explained. I want to understand them. Um, but of course, uh, one of the ways one progresses in science and technology is by figuring out things that we didn't know before and that we didn't understand. Sometimes we can then uh, understand how and why and sort of reason backwards and figure it out. Sometimes we can't, either because we don't uh, uh, have the tools yet and we'll get there eventually, or maybe just because it's darn complex. Uh, but, you know, at some point, we're okay with that. Quantum mechanics works. It's crazy. It makes no sense. Uh, it, it offends our demand for explanation, but it still works, and if it works, maybe we should be okay with it. So I guess I'm, I'm curious, thinking about sort of explainable AI, sort of wh when you think we need an explanation and why. Right? One reason we might need an explanation to go to the, sort of the previous question is to make people comfortable trusting the thing. Um, uh, but I guess I wonder whether we're not sort of limiting ourselves and limiting the AI from developing and figuring out new things, new pathways that humans never would, uh, if we want to sort of put them in a, in a world where they're going to have to sort of uh, give to us the set of rules and heuristics uh, that lead them to come to a particular conclusion. Yeah, so what's your question? Uh, well, so, so, the, so the question was, right, yeah. uh, uh, what is, under what circumstances do we need yeah. explainable AI, and under what circumstances, if any, are you comfortable with, uh, mm. uh, with uh, AI that produces results, uh, even if we don't understand the results? Yeah. Well, I guess um, I, you know, for almost any system, you want to have some level of explanation, right? You know, so just consider the, a, a robot. Um, do you not want, if you just meet a robot in a shopping center, do you not want to know what information that robot is collecting about you? Or even who owns the robot? That there's sort of high level uh, explanations that uh, you know, we, we, we should expect. Uh, and then in other systems where, uh, you know, the, the actual models that uh, people are using, like deep learning, they're imperspicuous. You, you can't really dig down. It, you know, it's easy cat because it's easy cat. Uh, well, even that's an explanation, right? So I think that um, we don't need explanations for everything, that's for sure. But if something surprising happens, or if you feel like uh, you've been... Uh, mistreated, discriminated against, I think you will want to know why, and you're going to be very unsatisfied if you don't get an answer. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Uh, we have to we, I, I can chat with you later. My question is actually <clears throat> very specific. You mentioned uh, a, a lab next door that's doing work with yeah. uh, disabled um, people. Is that... Uh, first of all, the, do they require implants, and are, are they published? Is there uh, information? That yes, uh, it's non-invasive, and the really surprising thing is they're essentially using just the uh, sort of ele electrostatic uh, on, on the surface of your head. So uh, they're able to use that to distinguish, you know, the five different kind of motions of the um, wheelchair. And, and is their work published? Yeah. So the leader of that group is Hong Nguyen at UTS, and he, uh, he does a lot of work in non-invasive technology, uh, the um, thought control wheelchair, but also um, diabetes. He's got a device that uh, can detect blood sugar without um, taking blood. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. All right. <laughs>